Well, good, e good evening, everybody, and, and welcome to this Thomas Jefferson Institute. It's not a federal policy dinner, but an informative webinar sponsored by the uh, Wrench Pierce Family Foundation. Before we begin, two things. One, I am right now surrounded by a lightning and thunder. And if the electric goes out, my internet capability may go out. So um, I will try to get back in using my phone as a hotspot, uh, but I think that our speaker will be able to stay on. And in, in that case, please do stay on and, and stay on anyway, and we'll see if I get back in, if we go out. Secondly, before introducing our guest speaker, I just wanted to point out that if you have a question, please put it in the question and answer box down below and we'll get to it just as soon as we can. In 2016, Donald Trump was elected president with less than a plurality of the popular vote. Uh, the, this resulted in spasms of anguish by Hillary Clinton's supporters, uh, resulting in a national move to replace the Electoral College with a national popular vote system. But five times in our history, presidents have been elected with less than a plurality, and nearly 20 times with less than a majority, including one president who was considered a buffoon by most newspapers. His name was Abraham Lincoln. America's founding fathers established a federalist nation of states, a written set of checks and balances designed to protect individual liberty against majority tyranny. Power struggles playing out even today continue to test the very essence of American federalism. But what about other constitutional republics around the world? Don't they elect their heads of government based on a majority vote? What's the impact of their system of governments and how effectively does it work? What might we face were we to follow similar systems? Michael C. Maybach is uniquely qualified to talk about these issues, having created Intel's Government Affairs Department and built a worldwide team of more than 150 professionals. In 2003, he became the president and CEO of the European American Business Council, where he grew its membership from seven to 75 multinational companies, necessarily dealing with different government laws and systems throughout the world. Today, he's a distinguished fellow at Save Our States, having given 80 talks in the last two years across the country in defense of the Founders Electoral College design. He serves on several nonprofit boards, including the Witherspoon Institute and the James Wilson Institute. Mr. Maybach has earned university degrees from Northern Illinois, California State, American, Georgetown, Ashland, and the Institute of World Politics. And with that, I'd like to welcome Mike Maybach, and I will share my screen with you, and you can take it away. All right, Chris, thank you very much. Honored to be here with you and your, your uh, friends and supporters of the Thomas Jefferson Institute for Public Policy. It's a very fine and unique institute in Virginia and a champion for good government and wise, limited government here. Uh, Thank you, each of you for tuning in this evening for this discussion. I'm going to start the slide deck. I will walk through it. I hope everybody can see that. And then uh, after about 30 minutes of uh, formal remarks, I think we're going to have about 45 minutes for Q&A to the extent that there's that many questions. So Mr. Jefferson, I think it's very apropos to quote Thomas Jefferson, educate and inform the whole mass of the people. They are the only sure reliance for the preservation of liberty. And let's be clear, the people that began our constitutional republic were focused on liberty. This wonderful writer and political scientist, Alexis de Tocqueville, a Frenchman, um, who came here and wrote Democracy in America in 1835, mm -hmm. there can be no doubt that the education of the people in the United States contributes powerfully to the perpetuation of their democratic republic. He wrote that when back home in France, they had King Charles X. So we're gonna talk about the Electoral College this evening and why the founders created it. Uh, some say it's an undemocratic uh, institution that ought to be eliminated. It's even voter suppression. Uh, Al Gore won more votes than uh, George W. Bush in 2000, even though Bush won 30 of the 50 states, same in 2016. Hillary Clinton won uh, more popular votes than Donald Trump, but he won 30 of the 50 states. So the question is, we were with the founders, should the majority rule? So let's talk about that. 
in all the talk these days about save our democracy, um, I think Mr. Washington respectfully would say, save our republic. And we are a republic because we have significant curbs, checks and balances on what a uh, free and sustained constitution looks like. We have this rich inheritance of separation of powers as everyone knows. Now, in the time of the American Revolution, the world was a pretty difficult place. Tyranny was everywhere. No one was voting anywhere except maybe in the Netherlands and England and only certain uh, wealthy people. Imperialism ruled the seas of the world. Ruthlessness across uh, world history, really going back to Herodotus and Xerxes attacking the Athenians. No social or economic mobility at all. If you were, your, you were a cobbler, your child would be a cobbler. If you were the king, your child would be the king or queen. Slaves everywhere. We didn't invent slavery in 1619. The Europeans brought it to North and South America, uh, but we have slaves in the Old Testament and the Roman Empire. There were slave trade routes in Africa, et cetera, and liberty virtually nowhere. They had a king or a tyrant or a emperor all over the world. Now our founders studied history and they knew what Cicero said, which is if you don't know history, you will always be a child. Think of a person taking down a statue uh, in a park in a city today in America, a person that may not know three sentences about the person whose statue they are removing. Now, the central idea that the founders were very clear about was that human nature is broken. We need to take that on fully, that across human history, uh, there has been difficulty because man's nature is broken. No matter how powerful our computers or our jet aircrafts or any of our technology, we can't improve upon human nature. At least that's what the founders believed. And to understand them, they were men of liberty, but also uh, of, of uh, checks and balances against power. Our roots are found deep in Western civilization in Athens and Rome. And I refer you to the writings of my friend, uh, Russell Kirk for more about that. This is the painting, a painting of Socrates on trial in the elected assembly of Athens, whether or not to put him to death for asking questions of the youth and not worshiping each and every Athenian God. And of course they voted by majority rule, by majority vote using black and white stones thrown into a basket to kill Socrates. And this painting done in 1787, it was painted by David in Paris during the Constitutional Convention of the United States. Uh, and this is of course Socrates taking the hemlock and the man in the orange uh, whose hand is on the knee of Socrates is Plato. And that was his teacher, Socrates was Plato's teacher. It so changed, this trial so changed uh, Plato that he, instead of being a warrior, started the first academy in the West, the first university, and he wrote Plato's Apology. And really, I always tell, especially uh, students, but any Americans, they must really read Plato's Apology, 40 some pages, to understand what happened in Athens and the broken nature of, of quote, democracy. When Plato then wrote his Republic, his most important tome in 375 BC, he writes in that book, tyranny naturally arises out of democracy because he witnessed it because he witnessed from the bushes, the trial of Socrates killing the old man for asking questions, no free speech, no freedom of thought. His number one student was Aristotle who wrote a book called The Politics. And in that he said the way to deal with the problem of democracy that his teacher had taught him about was a mixed regime, a Caesar, a Senate, and of course, Roman citizens. And this is the beginning of this thought of checks and balances and division of power. Matter of fact, this is a painting of the Roman Senate. And believe it or not, the Roman Senate had their own logo and you can see it on some buildings in Rome today. And even the manhole covers because 
um, uh, Mussolini had it put on the manhole covers when he was prime minister in Rome. But Rome went from a republic to an empire. This looks like downtown Washington, DC. Our founders wanted us to be a republic, not an empire, and they feared we would become an empire as Rome did become. Now, the number one book our founders quoted in their writings and their speeches in, in correspondence was the Bible. And the two books they quoted the most were Deuteronomy and Romans. They were um, greatly influenced by the lessons taught there about governance. As a matter of fact, the Liberty Bell, which was decided to be built by the Pennsylvania legislature in 1751, has only one quote is from the Old Testament, proclaim liberty throughout all the land and then to all the inhabitants, not diversity or some other word. They were people of freedom and we need to, of course, understand that. Now, the founders wanted to create a new government and they knew that under kings or emperors or queens, that power was always unlimited and therefore the people were powerless to determine their own society. And so they had to limit government to set people free. And the whole idea of writing the world's first national constitution of any importance was found in our constitution. And that was written, of course, first with the articles and then the 1787 constitution. We're in our second republic. The second most quoted book by the founders was Montesquieu's book, The Spirit of the Laws. He was a French philosopher who spent 20 years studying why democracies fail. And he came up with the modern ideas of checks and balances, which we find today in our government. So uh, he wrote this book in 1748. All the founders read Montesquieu, probably many of them in the original French. They also read um, uh, uh, Plato and Aristotle and others, Herodotus, et cetera. They were concerned about the tyranny of the majority. So they decided not a democracy, but a Republican government. And Jefferson writes, and of course, during the Constitutional Convention, he was the US ambassador in Paris. In questions of power then, let no more be heard of confidence in man but bind him down from the mischief by the chains of the Constitution. Here again, Jefferson's reminding us, man's nature is broken. We have to have checks and balances on power if we will be free. When Madison arrives in Philadelphia in May of 1787, he writes in his journal, the central problem of this Constitutional Convention will be representation, that's the word he used. We have nine small states and we have four states with large populations. Virginia was 750,000, 10 times the population of Georgia and even larger of Delaware and Rhode Island. Philadelphia was the largest city, New York and Boston, the next two largest cities. And of course, Virginia included West Virginia and Massachusetts, by the way, included the state of Maine at the time. And so he knew this large versus small state issue was the central problem of the convention. There's the Virginia plans, that's Madison's plan. It failed. Here's the fellow who decided he wanted to put together a convention. He got it done, but his plan was voted down. New Jersey plan by William Patterson was voted down. That was really to return to the Articles of Confederation. And then the great compromise when Madison and Roger Sherman Roger Sherman of Connecticut met with others and decided uh, between the House and Senate, the House will represent size of population, but the Senate, the Senate, every state, large or small, gets two votes. And this decision, this agreement made our constitution possible. That is all there is to it. And we will talk more about the Senate, which I call the assembly of the states later on in this talk. So the American federalism is this balance between the states and population in the Congress. Then they, the last week of the convention, they had to decide how to select the president. They put it off because there was no agreement on this. They finally voted, will it be a popular election? No, 
No state voted for that because of the large state uh, control that they feared. Election by Congress, no, then the president would simply be a, uh, a tool of the Congress and they could do, with what, do away with the president anytime they wanted. Election by the states, yes, let's have some mechanism for the states to aggregate their votes and elect the president. Of course, this is what the Electoral College is about. And so in Federal 51, Madison writes about the idea of having a president with a will of his own and energy in the executive as, as Hamilton writes in Federalist 97. So the Electoral College was a design just like the Congress. You have populations voting in the states and then the states which have the number of Senate and House members, they aggregate with the other states their votes. And so in effect, we reproduce the 535 members of Congress across the states, which are presidential electors, and then they aggregate their votes in the state capitals uh, for president, and that's how we come to this solution. So people that say they believe in majority rule, we would say there's majority rule 50 times in America. If you want democracy, we have 50 de democratic votes, and then, this, then the result of each of those votes is put together, and we have the electoral college. Now, there's great benefits to the Electoral College. One is, even when you have four people running, as we did in 1860, you have a winner. Why was that? Lincoln only got 39.8% of the votes. So 60% of the people voted against Abraham Lincoln, but he won 18 of the 33 states. And if you think states are important today, they were very important back when states were seceding from the Union. And he was seen, at least by most, as legitimately elected because he won the majority of the states. He had success in the salmon colored states. Stephen Douglas from Illinois only won Missouri because Lincoln destroyed him in the Lincoln Douglas debates, which is another talk. And then Bell won the middle states, Kentucky uh, and Virginia and uh, Tennessee and then Breckinridge, another Democrat. So three Democrats ran against one Republican. The Democratic Party badly split over the Dred Scott decision and the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which those two really caused our civil war to come to a head. Since 1900, only two presidents have won without the majority of our states. Kennedy, because Harry S. Byrd of Virginia uh, ran for president, won two states. And Jimmy Carter, because Gerald Ford just got more states uh, by, uh, he got 27. Now let's talk about Europe. There's 27 member countries and they have 27 heads of government. Now heads of state is often a king or a queen or some sort of a, a titular president, but heads of government in Europe are these people that wear these blue suits that are required by law to wear these blue suits apparently, except Mrs. Merkel has this red outfit on. Of the 27, uh, heads of government in Europe, how many are elected by a national popular vote? Just two. Cyprus, which is an island, it's half of an island, really, and it's uh, uh, very few people uh, live there. And then France, historically, they have a runoff election, so they have a national popular vote. All the rest have a completely different system. Now, why is that? Well, history, as Cicero reminded us, is very important to these things. The French Revolution in 1789, the year we were uh, putting our constitution into action, they went from a king to a parliament and by 1801 had a king again, Napoleon. So the French Revolution was a failure because of the way they designed their government unlike ours. You had matter of fact, a reign of terror for five years and they invented the guillotine to make uh, the um, <laughs> mechanization of killing so much easier because there were so many people to do away with in that bloody revolution. Tocqueville comes to America in 1830 to write about our democracy because his grandfather lived through the revolution in France and then his father through Napoleon and now he had a king and he asked himself, the Americans got rid of their king and now they have presidents year after year after year, and we have uh, a parliament, and then we have Napoleon, and then we have kings, 
and on and on. What, why is democracy working in America? And of course, there was a second French Revolution in 1848 and led to the second French Republic. They're on their fifth now. And look at this. The French Revolution in 1789 was the first year of our Constitution. Our Constitution is 233 years old. This is what's happened in that same period of time in France. They had a revolution and a National Assembly. They had a first republic, then they had Napoleon and an empire. Then they have kings again, then different set of kings. And then a second revolution, the second French Republic, the second French empire, the third republic, fourth and the fifth. And of course the Nazis took over in the forties. And so my gosh, their constitution is 64 years old and yet their revolution began when we started our current constitution, which is more stable and secure. Of course, ours is. And across Europe in 1848, mostly because of famine, potato famine and other blights to crops, um, great unemployment, uh, 30 countries had revolutions and mob rule. And that really taught the Europeans, they really didn't like mob rule. Matter of fact, 1859, John Stuart Mill writes about uh, in his book on liberty, kings were to protect their subjects, but they came to tyrannize them. Democracy cured royal tyranny and then elected majorities tyrannized minorities. This is the problem the founders saw. This is the Electoral College of Great Britain. If you're a teacher and you have a student that, or a friend that doesn't like the Electoral College system in America, ask them what the Electoral College is in Great Britain. Mr. Churchill, Mrs. Thatcher, Boris Johnson, never on the ballot of all United Kingdom. They were elected here after they were elected by only their constituency, in their case, in London. This is the Electoral College in Germany, 10 political parties, just like the UK. This is where Mrs. Merkel for 12 years was elected Chandler. Chandler. And now this is where they've elected their new chancellor. This is the Electoral College of Spain, eight political parties, on and on and on. We can do 25 of these. In Switzerland, they don't even have a chief executive. They have a federal council of seven members. So much did they want to disaggregate power. This is the Canadian Electoral College. By the way, they have six political parties in Canada. Most Americans don't know that, but they do. And in 2021, this man, there. Hudo um, was re-elected prime minister, um, not Peter, Pierre Trudeau, but his son, I'm sorry. Um, but his party, Liberal Party, only got 33% of the vote. The Conservatives got 34% of the vote, and the other parties divided the other 40%. But the Liberal Party got the most seats, the most seats in Parliament. These are other countries whose head of government is elected by parliament, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, Norway, Morocco, India, Singapore. Multi-party systems all, all of them have four, five, six, eight, ten 10 parties, very unstable. Matter of fact, in Europe, the average European country has nine political parties today. And since 1975, their prime ministers last half as long as in, in that period, 1975. This man, after 36 months, just now resigned. And September 5th, guess how they'll get a new prime minister in, in Great Britain? By the Conservative Party vote, not by the people on the street. Only the members of his party will elect their prime minister. This man just resigned, Prime Minister Mario Draghi of Italy, after only 18 months, and this man in June resigned as Israeli's prime minister after only 12 months in office. Now, in the six months between, in the overlap between Draghi and uh, Natali Bennett, they had a meeting, <laughs> as you can see. But what would be left of their uh, agreements if both of them are now out of office and were in and out of office in a period of 18 months or less? Just think if we had nine political parties in the US House, we might have a US Speaker of the House every three months or more as the par parties coalitions would break apart. 
So majority rule, well, these are places you might want to vacation in. This is where they have the heads of government elected and a national popular vote. Iran, Nicaragua, Venezuela, Russia, Afghanistan, Mexico, Turkey, Zimbabwe. These are not stable places. Now, should the Speaker of the House represent the majority of vote? Well, majority of the House members, but for example, in 2012, John Boehner, elected by 234 House members who were Republicans as the Speaker of the House. Mrs. Pelosi was the minority leader, but her 201 congressmen in her party got 49% of the popular vote cast on House members and the Republicans 48. So he was a minority speaker, so to speak. Matter of fact, 12 times in US history, we have had minority speakers when the opposition party had received more votes than the members that elected the speaker. But let's talk about baseball now for those that are tired of politics. The wonderful 1960 World Series game between the Pirates and the New York Yankees and the famous walk-off home run by Mazurowski. You can see him there in the dugout and hitting that home run. The Pirates won four games to three. And baseball fans would say, of course, because it's always the best out of seven. But did you know in those seven games, the Pirates scored 27 runs and the Yankees 55 in those games, the highest ever scored by a team in the World Series. The, Yan the Yankees had 91 hits, the Pirates only 60 hits. And the batting averages, the Yankees much better batting averages, and the Pirates hit four home runs in seven games, the Yankees 10 home runs. So was it fair that the Pirates won? Well, they won the most games just like, just like in so many sports, like March Madness, it's not the most points, it's the most games. Same with the Super Bowl and many, many other things. And yet after Al Gore lost to George W. Bush, uh, some people in California put together some money, hired a couple of professors, came up with this idea of the national popular vote, and in 2006 launched the National Popular Vote Compact. And 15 all Democratic legislatures have passed that compact into law with 195 electoral votes in their pocket. They're trying to get 275, which would create a constitutional crisis, which is why Save Our States was founded in 2009 to try to stop this. We did defeat it in Virginia in May the last couple of years. This is the U.S. by population. You can hardly find most states here. Half of our population is in nine states. Are we really going to have a national popular vote where candidates only campaign in the large cities? Los Angeles County has more people than 41 states. Here's a different planet, Montana. Very different mindset, different life. Here's Manhattan, the island of Manhattan. New York City has more people than 39 states, including Virginia. This is Central Park. It has 843 beautiful acres. How many of these acres are farmed? Well, actually, not one of these acres is farmed. If it was farmed, Central Park could feed 168 people because the US Department of Agriculture says it takes five acres to feed one person for a year. And yet in Manhattan, there's a whole food store full of fruits and vegetables and corn on the cob, et cetera. What's happened here? They're not farming in New York City, are they? No, these people feed the cities. This is why we've been having our presidential primaries start in Iowa, because these are the kind of people that feed the cities. And if we begin with the, our primaries in the big cities, these people will never, ever, ever have a voice. And they will not be serfs. The average farmer today feeds over 200 people, one person on a farm. 3% of our land con contains 75% of our population. All the rest are people feeding those population centers, and they need to have a voice if we are to be a united republic. We have our second primary in New Hampshire because it's retail politics, small shops, small restaurants, small farms, 
people meet in person the candidates for office. And so those two filters of agriculture and small town America helped us to get to the path to a good presidential selection. Finally, it took 13 states to write, write and ratify the Declaration and the Constitution. We have an assembly of states, the Senate. Every state gets two votes equally. The Senate confirms uh, members of, the, of courts, Supreme Court, et cetera, and ambassadors and cabinet officials. They try impeachments. They decide if a judge or a president is going to be thrown out of office, they're the jury. They accept or, or deny uh, trade agreements and treaties from all over the world. And yet this current president says the majority should rule in the US Senate where he served for 36 years. And, and while he was in the Senate, he defended the filibuster many times. So this is puzzling for those that believe in the Senate as the balance to the House. This other Senator said the filibuster is the only check we have in the Senate. So there's disagreement about this, but this, the, the reason we have the checks and balances is so we don't have majority tyranny in all of our, uh, in all of our doings in the Congress. And on and on, it takes not 26, but 38 states uh, to amend the Constitution. Every state capital has a Republican government guaranteed by the Constitution, which means a House and a Senate and a governor and a court system, et cetera. Uh, and finally, then, our electoral college is found in the capitals of our 50 states every four years. It's majority rule times 50. And if people are unhappy in their states, they can vote with their seats, with their feet. We just changed seven seats in the U.S. Congress that moved to different states. Uh, as you know, we started out with 13 states. Now we have 50 since 1787 when we wrote our Constitution world's oldest constitution today. The Electoral College is indispensable in choosing our president and therefore keeping this country united. Uh, Abraham Lincoln reminds us, don't interfere with anything in the constitution that must be maintained for it is the only safeguard of our liberties. And with that, I thank you for your attention. And uh, Chris, I think we have time for questions. Thank you. We do, and I'd remind, well, oh, let me get my, visage on that. I, I remind you to put your questions into the Q&A section and uh, we will read them off. I, I did have a, a question as I as I look through that. Now, every state in the union, uh, it's, it's, it's winner take all with two exceptions. That's right. Um, and one is Maine, one is I think Nebraska. That's if, right. If they are sorted by congressional district. That's right. What are the potential, aside from the fact that Democrats in New York and Virginia would never allow that to happen because they would lose votes to Republicans right. and Republicans in Alabama and Mississippi would never allow it to happen because they'd lose votes to Democrats. Are there any ramifications of that um, as as a, I hate to use the word compromise, but what, what in your view are the potential ramifications of that? It is a very good question. And um, uh, our view at Save Our States is that any legislature can decide to disaggregate their electors by congressional district, and then whoever wins the whole state gets the two uh, votes, you know, based on the two Senate seats. Uh, Nebraska and Maine have done this in order to lure candidates from both parties because they're not high population states. And of course, Maine is not that easy to get to. It's pretty, pretty far north. Um, if we had done this in 2012 in all 50 states, Romney would have defeated Barack Obama. He won that many congressional districts. So it does have a, a it does make a difference. States can do that, Chris, but they don't because they they know that the winner take all um, either uh, attracts candidates of both parties if they're a toss up state, let's say Ohio or something, or if it's a one party state, they want to keep all of those electoral votes. They don't want to disaggregate them. Uh, I'll give you an example. When Trump ran against Mrs. Clinton in 2016, I grew up in Illinois. There's 102 counties in Illinois. Mrs. Clinton won the state by popular vote in Illinois. Of the 102 counties, she won 12 and Trump won 90. 
<laughs> and so if they had disaggregated the electors in, in uh, my home state of Illinois, um, Mr. Trump would have gotten several, maybe, I don't know, three or five electors from that state. And the same with Mrs. Clinton in a, in let's say a Republican, all Republican state, you know, but, um, but states are not likely to disaggregate them very often. The only two states do it. You and I were both at a dinner last night where we saw a, a, a map with the real estate all in red because it belonged to Republicans, but the, the population centers all in blue because they belong yeah. to Democrats. And, and I guess it's sort of the same thing. Again, I, let me remind everyone, put your questions into the Q&A. Um, let me ask, uh, well, Gary Porter asks, a national popular vote is extra constitutional, yet the left drags it out every four years. Why do, why do we let them? <laughs> Hello, Gary. Uh, Gary's a friend from, from uh, the Tidewater area. Um, so it's a trick question. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a good question. Um, the, the compact clause of the Constitution says that states shall not have compacts among them unless the Congress accepts by a, by a majority vote, accepts the compact is something that can be allowed. The National Popular Vote Compact people have not taken their compact to the, to the Congress, maybe because it wouldn't win there, I don't think it would, um, but they're rolling the dice uh, to see if they could create a constitutional crisis. You know, I think you have to understand that folks on the left that want to take down this part of the Constitution want to take down other parts. And for example, those that want to pack the Supreme Court, and we've had discussion of that the last two years. Um, well, if you pack a Supreme Court and then you have something like the National Popular Vote Compact, maybe a packed Supreme Court would say, well, that's okay because the legislature's passed it. So, um, there's, there's lots of um, equal protection clause problems with national popular vote. For example, Delaware has no early voting in Virginia. I think we have six weeks here where I live. And so if we had a national popular vote with different voting rules, like in Oregon, they have all mail-in ballots and other states don't do that. We would have a, we'd have a constitutional litigation about just the fact that the states have all different rules. I mean, Georgia just changed some of their rules which are actually uh, more liberal than Colorado's are. So there's, there's different election laws around the country. And it's another reason why the left in HR1, that's the, that was the first bill they put in, was to try to nationalize our elections as part of this whole idea to have a national popular vote. So these things have to be seen as one whole uh, plan, if you will, on changing our uh, democracy, as they say. Elena asks uh, three questions, and, and a couple of them are pretty easy. I think they're pretty short to answer. How is the number of electors in a state established, and, and how is it decided whether a candidate who wins the state gets the electors or partial electors, which I, I think is probably a follow-up to, to my question. Yeah. Thanks, Elena. Good question. So um, I live in Virginia. We have 11 congressional U.S. congressional seats in the House of Representatives because of our population, which is about 9 million, not quite. Uh, we have two US senators because we're states. So Virginia has 13 electors because two senators plus we have 11 in the house. That's how you do it. Uh, Wyoming, I think, I think still has one house seat. Yeah, still one. And so that means they have two senators, one house seat, they have three electors. Now, um, the except for Maine and Nebraska, Whoever wins the popular vote in the state gets 100% of their electors because the state legislatures decided that would be the rule. The state legislatures decide how, who, how electors are chosen. In the early, early days of the Republic, some state leg uh, legislatures actually selected the electors themselves. They can't be members of the legislature or the US Congress, but they can select them. But very quickly, it became a popular vote. I hope that's uh, answers your question. In Maine and in, in, in Nebraska, it's whoever wins each congressional district gets one electoral vote. Whoever wins the total votes in the state, they get the two for the two U.S. Senate. Um, Elena also asked the question, I saved it to keep it separately because, um, and the question is, what, what do you think about ranked choice uh, voting? 
And um, I, I just came back, as you know, from, from Alaska where my son lives and he received his voting instructions uh, for how to vote in a ranked choice voting election. And if anybody wants to uh, see the, the number of permutations you have to go through to do that, uh, just email me. You've got my email address. I'll send you a copy of uh, the yeah. photo I took of the directions. But what are your thoughts about that? Uh, the um, one of the wonderful things about the Electoral College is we have a two party system. Remember when I went through the slides and I said you, the British have 10 parties and the Spanish have nine or eight and on and on. When you have a parliamentary system, you have three, four, five, six. The Canadians have six parties in their parliament, for example, and six parties on the ballot. You get this disaggregation. Of, of a sustained majority to keep a government together. We only have a two-party system in the United States with 320 million people. I mean, that's stunning that we only have two parties. It's because of the winner-take-all presidential primary. Uh, Ross Perot, when he ran for president in uh, 1992, he got 20% of the popular vote nationally, and he won zero electors. And Eugene Debs, who ran for president as a socialist three times, on one occasion got 19% of the popular vote in America and got zero electoral votes. And what the electoral college system says to politicians is, if you, if you have any serious intention of becoming president or vice president of the United States, you gotta join one of the two teams, which really then reverberates down to all the different offices in the legislature because people start at the local and state office before they become congressmen, they work their way up. Harry Truman was a county a commissioner, like I was when I was in college, I was a county board member. Uh, Tim Kaine, who's a US Senator from Virginia, he started his political career as a Democrat in the city council of Richmond, Virginia. So once you choose a political party as a young person, let's say in the city council, state legislature, you keep that party because that's, those are your people. And if you wanna be president, it's because you spent a lifetime like Joe Biden in the Democratic party, right? So you're not going to start a third and fourth, fifth party. Uh, so ranked choice voting is an attempt to disaggregate our two party system, but it will, it will be um, chaos in our legislative bodies in our Congress if we start to have uh, five, six, seven, eight, especially with 300 million people, I mean, the largest, population in Europe is Germany with 80 million people. Just think uh, a Congress with uh, 12 parties. How would we ever we talk about gridlock? How would we ever have anything happen today in the U.S. Constitution, Congress at all? So your thought, simply put, is that is that a national, popular, a national popular vote would lead to the balkanization and third parties, fourth parties, fifth parties that Oh, if if we had a national popular vote, Mark Zuckerberg or somebody else with a billion dollars would just declare for president. They don't care what is say I'm in the Zuckerberg party or I'm in the, you know, the pick a billionaire that you like and fly all over the country in the ma major media markets and run their campaign. Because, you know, <laughs> nine states have half the people and you don't need to go to any place that has agriculture anymore. The flyover states, as they call them. And the primaries, there wouldn't be party primaries anymore. I mean, one of the one of the um, things that's so curious is that that people that that are, let's say in the Democratic Party that want to have the national popular vote, they think we'll still have two parties. We will not have two parties. We will we will disaggregate all that because the electoral college is what forces the two party system uh, to work the way it does. So. So anyway, I think national popular vote would be very bad for America, and I sure hope it's not tried. They do it in Maine, and they do it in Alaska, those two faraway states. Gary makes the point that the education problem we face begins in the public schools. Is there a lesson plan or curriculum that explains the electoral college, as you just did, that we can obtain and give to a local public school teachers? While you think about about the curriculum, let me just say that that we did invite teachers, a number of teachers to participate in this, and some of them may have. We are also recording this and will be uh, posting it and and informing teachers around the state 
uh, of this uh, this particular webinar. I know we got uh, you and I got it, Michael, uh, an email from from one teacher saying that he could not make it and specifically asking if we were posting it so that he could use it in his classroom. So, yeah. uh, but is, is there a curriculum or is there um, a document that if you if you were a high school teacher or an elementary school teacher, mm -hmm. so aside from the Constitution itself and the original source documents, is there something you would recommend? Well, there's a woman who's associated with Save Our State named Tara Ross, R-O-S-S, -S, and she has a video on Prager University, which is the number one viewed video of any Prager video on the Electoral College, and wherein she explains it. She also has written two, two um, significant books about it, and she's written a children's book on the Electoral College as well for grade school kids. Um, I've made a note because Typically, I speak to college students and above. I teach at Rotary Clubs, uh, uh, different civic groups. And I'm just not aware that there's a K through 12 set of materials just on the Electoral College. But I'm going to, I've made a note to ask around and see if I can find out. Terrific. And if you do, let me know and we'll get it out to folks. Okay, thank now, you. Kenneth makes the point the population knows little about how the Electoral College works. Largely, it has been a rubber stamp or ignored. A number of abnormalities of electors have occurred over the last hundred years to no event. And I assume that's a reference to, for example, in 1976, uh, I think it was 76, someone voted for the libertarian candidate for, for president from Virginia. Uh, how can we explain the true importance of the electoral college for the future and where it will be critical? Well, the um, Chris mentioned that on five occasions we've had um, uh, non-majority rule uh, instances. The first one was in 1824 when Andrew Jackson won the plurality of votes. There were four candidates, uh, including Henry Clay, John Quincy Adams, um, uh, Andrew Jackson and one other candidate, um, but no one won the Electoral College, so it was thrown into the House of Representatives, where each state delegation votes with just one vote. So everybody from uh, Kentucky had one vote for president, et cetera. Henry Clay and John Quincy Adams threw their support together, and John Quincy Adams was elected um, even though he had fewer votes than Andrew Jackson. Jackson, four years later, came back and won the presidency twice outright with the Electoral College and the popular vote. The next time was in 1876. Uh, 1876, this is a Hayes-Tilden election where Governor Tilden of New York and, and, uh, and Hayes, Rutherford B. Hayes, were um, almost tied in electors. I think it was 151 to very close to 151, but there were three states that hadn't reported, Florida, South Carolina, and Louisiana, because they all still had troops from the re re reconstruction era. And, um, <laughs> and the deal was made in, in a commission, they had a, a commission to decide the presidency. They gave it to Hayes rather than Tilden, but President Hayes, a Republican, had to agree to withdraw all federal troops from those three states. And he immediately upon being elected as commander in chief withdrew all the federal troops from the South. And of course, Jim Crow then took hold in the South. Uh, uh, the, other, the others were, um, we've already talked about George W. Bush, Hillary Clinton and Trump, uh, et cetera. Jacqueline, who clearly is a teacher, indicates she would use this in her classroom. She'd love to have the PowerPoint. Uh, is, it will, it, can that be made available to anybody on request? So I've just given it the PowerPoint on this video, and this video will be available. No, that's true. send yeah. out that's PowerPoint right. slide decks. They, they, they go online and, and they get changed, and all of a sudden you're responsible for what the changes are made. But... Um, there are other videos as well. Um, there's a group called Moms for America where I have four different videos 
about electoral college and slavery, electoral college and the party system, et cetera. And so there's four different uh, themes on Moms for America. You just go to the website and type in my last name, Maybach, and you can get that. And you just, you know, I have a, I have a TED talk. So there's lots of videos available. Uh, wh wh where does she teach? I, I don't know. She may answer that question, but somewhere in Virginia, I assume. She makes the point that there's, there is no standard. There's no sort of curriculum. And it's true. Curricula. In, yeah. in Virginia is decided at the local level as, as it yeah. probably should be. Well, it's a so. good it's a good topic for us. I, honestly, I, I just don't know about K through 12 materials. Um, and I, as you mentioned, Chris, I go around the country and around Virginia where I live um, giving this talk. I, I visit high schools. Um, I'll visit a grade school and try to explain it to them. So um, if she's around uh, somewhere here in Northern Virginia, maybe I'll come to her school. Well, we, and you and I should have a conversation offline about whether or not creating uh, some documentation, even, I hate to say it, a graphic novel, uh, that would help explain this in simple terms yeah. to, to young people would be good. Uh, an, an anonymous member makes the comment that the recount of the, I hadn't thought about this, recount of the Bush-Gore election in Florida was a nightmare and that if the popular vote was as close as it was in 2016, it would dictate a recount of the entire national yeah. vote. That's a wonderful point. At one of my other presentations, I make that point. I have a picture of the Titanic. And then if, you, if you've all seen the movie Titanic, remember, as soon as they hit the iceberg, the designer of the Titanic is on board the ship. And he gets out the, the diagram and he says, we designed the different compartments in the ship and we and for budgetary reasons, we didn't close and seal each one. So remember, he says it's going to leak from this one and this one. And they actually could predict exactly how long it would take for the Titanic to sink. And it, 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 it happened that way. Um, so the wonderful thing about the Electoral College, if we have a Florida recount, we have the compartment sealed. We don't have to recount the whole ship of state. And if we had a national popular vote and we have a problem in one state reporting, you say, well, we're going to have to recount, you know, what, 180 million votes? Are you kidding? That would take six months and a litigation forever. We would probably never decide a president with a national recount. And so one of the great <laughs> strengths in electoral colleges is all compartmentalized in the USS Electoral College, which doesn't sink. The Titanic is a great analogy. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's a it is. I should put that in this speech here. Well, I will indicate again, if, if anyone has any questions, please put them in the Q&A section. And since sometimes people put it in the chat, no, they didn't. Um, we may be approaching the end of this uh, uh, Jacqueline says she teaches in Virginia, in Virginia yeah, which I assume she, but... maybe offline she could tell you where she is. In Virginia. Jacqueline, you we have uh, uh, you have my email address. Please give me a well, please email me or give me a call on my on at our office number. I'll get back to you and and maybe we can have a di discussion and you can be the one to help design something that we can use around the state. Maybe I can end with just a story, Chris. Yeah. Um, the, the uh, view behind me, of course, is Independence Hall, as it is today and as it was in 1787, and frankly, 1776 when they wrote the Constitution. Remember, they chose these green colors because, of course, that's the color of the House of Commons in England, uh, if you think about it. And the Senate, is the U.S. Senate, is the same color of the House of Lords, which is that royal, that sort of burgundy color. And we see this in some state capitals. But right behind me is where George Washington sat for those three and a half months. He never said a word as a presiding officer. He never put his thumb on the scale. Uh, he, he never said a word for or against an argument during the debates because you know he was really wanted to be the independent chair and not be seen as favoring a smaller or large space, especially because he came from Virginia the biggest state of them all. However, we are told that during the meals, when they would go off for a meal, he would say to these delegates, 
we need to have an independent executive. Energy in the executive is Hamilton Wrights and Federalist 78. We, because when I was running the revolution in America for seven and a half years, all I had to appeal to were the 13 members of the Continental Congress, one per state. And so I, I worked for 13 leaders, none of whom agreed on everything, and all of whom didn't want to pay for everything, et cetera. And there's no national taxation, et cetera. And what we really need is during time of war, especially, was to have a strong executive that's independent can be the commander in chief. And he would ask these delegates, have you ever been on a ship in a storm that didn't have a captain? What would it be like to be all these crew members, all these sails up, a hurricane is coming and nobody's in charge. You need to have a chief executive, a commander in chief, especially in time of war when the storms are coming. And that's why we have this presidency and not a prime minister like the rest of Europe has. And, it, and every four years, no matter what, even in the middle of civil war, we had a presidential election. I showed you the slide about France where they have all these kings and tyrants and on and off in different constitutions. And we've had the same constitution for 233 years through thick and through thin, through depression, world war, on and on, um, impeachment, et cetera, and we've survived. So um, it's a wonderful constitution and something to be sustained. Um, and there is, uh, it, it looks like there's one other question. I think they were people telling, telling oh. you how great you were. <laughs> well, I'll send and them. And indeed, you were your command of of the facts right. and the and the details and and frankly, the sort of the trivia was just superb. And uh, I, I'm I'm tempted to say you're you were wasted in business because you would have been a great <laughs> teacher. And, and frankly, at this point, we could we right. could use you in uh, well uh, in the classroom. If any of any of our audience belongs to a civic group or they teach, uh, they go to college and want me to come and speak to their classes. I'm, I speak in universities all the time and I'll be happy to visit Rotary clubs, Republican groups, Democratic groups. Could, could you give your email address so people can contact you if they- Yeah, if they think it's my initials, MCM, so Michael Charles Maybach, MCM at my last name, M-A-I-B-A-C-H dot U-S for United States, not dot com. So it's MCM, at maybach.us, that's it. And if you've, uh, and I don't charge anything, we have a travel budget. Um, I spoke in Dallas, Texas last week. In April, I was at Harvard University and in June at Hillsdale College. So I do this, we travel all over the country, just giving this message so that people can defend the electoral college. From Harvard to Hillsdale, that must have been an interesting experience. <laughs> at, at, at Harvard, some of the students tore down the signs inviting them to my speech at Hillsdale. I think nobody turned on the sides, but it was all good though. Happy to be both places. I hope not. Well, thank you again, Michael. This has been outstanding. I know you've got a couple of other presentations in your pocket. We may have you back again. And thank you all of you who tuned in. I appreciate it very much. I hope it's uh, educational and helpful. We will put this up on our YouTube channel and uh, I hope you can make the next one. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good night.